Ethereum is um, you know, primarily a yeah, platform for layer twos. Sending coins around between different L2s should just uh, feel to the user like sending coins between different Ethereum L1 addresses. You know, users live on layer twos, layer twos live on uh, layer one, and uh, layer one basically yeah, focuses on being this like fairly secure and like fairly minimal base layer for that. Don't try to like pigeonhole blockchains and coins into stuff. Like blockchains and coins continue to be valuable and continue to uh, have their use, but they're only one part of the world. There's like entire other aspects of uh, openness and uh, decentralization that are super valuable. This episode is proudly brought to you by Gnosis, a visionary collective committed to fostering and expanding applications for a decentralized future. Gnosis is at the forefront of innovation with Gnosis Pay, Circles, and Metri, revolutionizing open banking and creating a superior form of money. With Hashi and Gnosis VPN, they are building a more resilient and privacy-focused open internet. Are you seeking a robust L1 to launch your project? Well, look no further than Gnosis Chain. Enjoy the same development environment as Ethereum, but with significantly lower transaction fees. And with a robust network of over 200,000 validators, Gnosis Chain stands as a credibly neutral and resilient foundation for your application. Governance at Gnosis is driven by Gnosis DAO, where everyone has a voice in shaping the project's future. Join the Gnosis community today by participating in the Gnosis DAO governance forum. You can deploy your project on the EVM compatible and highly decentralized Gnosis Chain, or help secure the network by running a validator with just a single GNO and low cost hardware. Embark on your journey towards decentralization today at Gnosis.io. Cars One is one of the biggest node operators globally and help you stake your tokens on 45 plus networks like Ethereum, Cosmos, Celestia, and DYDX. More than 100,000 delegators stake with Chorus One, including institutions like BitGo and Ledger. Staking with Chorus One not only gets you the highest yields, but also the most robust security practices and infrastructure that are usually exclusive for institutions. You can stake directly to Chorus One's public node from your wallet, set up a white label node, or use the recently launched product, Opus, to stake up to 8,000 ETH in a single transaction. You can even offer high-yield staking to your own customers using their API. Your assets always remain in your custody, so you can have complete peace of mind. Start staking today at Chorus.one. Why do you want to make Ethereum so hard? Why do I want to make Ethereum so hard? I mean, uh, you know, we do this not because it is easy, but because we thought it would be easy. Making Ethereum hard would be easy. Uh, no, no, I mean, in that case, I meant Ethereum itself, uh, but, uh, you know, like I, at the beginning, I literally thought that we'd just like get the whole thing done in a couple of months. Um, and then, uh, uh like I just do it during my, yeah, third, um, off term from Waterloo. And then I just like go right back to university and be a college student. Mm. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, instead it ended up taking like, uh, like 20 years to watch the first version and then yeah. uh, you know, like another seven years to get to proof of stake. Yeah, it didn't work out so well. Yeah. But, you know, yeah, it's okay. I think it's been fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, how's your ECC been? Um, you know, it's uh, definitely one of the yeah, more fun and busy ones. Um, you know, uh, just uh, a whole bunch of uh, different events. Like, I feel like this one has like become you know, even more side eventy than, uh, you know, the ones in the past, which is like, uh, you know, on the one hand, it's like, yay, decentralization, um, and, uh, uh, you know, like permissionless innovation and uh, all of those things. And uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, you have uh, different events that are like, uh, you know, like 2.8 kilometers away from each other, um, sometimes, uh, you know, even more. And the ones that are 2.8 kilometers from each other are like separated through by, uh, a space that it takes uh, even longer to get uh, through um, by car than it does on foot. And I mean, so, it's like blockchain. Yeah, yeah. You have the L1, and like the L1's expensive, and nobody wants wait, to. Wait, wait, wait. In this, you wait, 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 sorry. In this case, oh, oh, okay. I thought, uh, sorry. I thought you meant, you meant like L1. I was trying to figure out if by L1 you meant like going on foot or by car. Um, I guess, uh, no, because like cars here are like uh, super slow. I'm trying to find, uh, you know, the right crypto analogy to them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what does it mean for Ethereum to be hard? Yeah, I mean, the different ki different kinds of hardness. I mean, the kind of hardness we ultimately want is hard to attack, right? Mm, um, yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, 
I mean, what, what other kinds of uh, hardness uh, are there? You know, hard to use. I think that's obviously <laughs> been, uh, you know, one of the topics, right? And, uh, you know, I've been, uh, like, basically, yeah, you know, yelling at people for the whole week and for the past while on Twitter and, like, getting them to adopt, you know, like, stuff like ERC-3770 and, like, basically try to make the the cross L2 ecosystem, uh, you know, feel smoother. And so, like, sending coins around between different L2s should just... Uh, feel to the user like sending coins um, around um, like on uh, if, between different ethereum l1 addresses um so uh, a lot of things uh, you know to fix there um obviously yeah you know uh hard in terms of fees being expensive uh, though uh, that's uh i mean we actually got you know like, we, we got the blobs out and uh, you know since we got the blobs out uh, you know layer twos have been uh reliably yeah it's, you know like less cheaper than uh, 0.01 cents a transaction I and mean, even during some of the crazy spikes right so uh, yeah even then um i think uh, they only got to like a, like 10 cents or like somewhere in the tens of cents like very briefly right so uh, yeah i think you know we've made a lot of progress there and then obviously we'll make even more progress with um you know pure dos uh, that's uh hopefully yeah coming quite soon and then even more data availability sampling and so we'll be able to have even more blobs so let, let's um yeah, i was watching i watched the video of your talk uh, I, didn't, I didn't make it to your talk but um um can you walk through like i mean in, in your talk you sort of talked you discussed the different mm -hmm. um outcomes for ethereum mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. one of those outcomes was for ethereum to be very simple Mm -hmm. um to just like do proof verification yeah um and then there's mm -hmm. like the opposite side of that so could you like sort of walk us through the mm -hmm. spectrum of what that looks like yeah um so like i think on that particular slide i had uh, basically like four different options right so uh the yeah i guess uh, kind of status quo option so far is like the one that's the second from the left right which is basically that uh Ethereum is, um, you know, primarily a yeah, platform for layer twos, and uh, users as individuals would mainly, yeah, you know, like use layer one for basically, yeah, you know, like moving um, assets and like especially non fungible assets between layer twos, possibly like exiting in the case of, uh, you know, like some kind of fraud proof uh, emergency or whatever. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, users live on layer twos, layer twos live on uh, layer one, and uh, Layer one basically, yeah, focuses on being this like fairly secure and like fairly minimal base layer for that. Um, and uh, I mean, a big theme of my talk, right, is basically that like we could actually do a lot more in optimizing Ethereum for that kind of goal, right? And uh, like I talked about things like uh, improving our ability to recover from 51% attack, improving our censorship resistance, improving our quantum resistance. And like these are goals that actually don't detract from like any of the other vision, right? I think they're even uh, a lot of them are compatible with the other visions, right? But there are differences around the edges, right? Um, so like for example, uh, you know, like, you know, I think uh, if you want to really optimize for being like focused on L twos as they are today, then like you do a single SWAT finality, but then like you possibly just like accept a slower block time, like maybe you know like sixteen or thirty two seconds for a round of finality, and then you just let L two pre confirmations uh, do anything else. Um, then, uh, yeah, on that diagram, if you go like all the way to the left, that that's like radically simplifying the L1 to make it L2 focused. And the idea I had there is like, you basically kick the EVM out of Ethereum, right? Basically, yeah. Like if you think about it, Ethereum already has pretty strong separation between the execution and the consensus layer. And so what you do is you basically define a new, like, much more restricted form of execution where that execution is basically just proving, like, one type of zero-knowledge proof, right? Yeah, yeah. And then the only thing that exists would basically be, yeah, you know, like, layer twos that would have to be roll-ups or, or validiums that would then be, yeah, you know, like, defined by, yeah, a zero-knowledge proof uh, verification key, right? And uh, that kind of future, like, basically, yeah, you know, what you would, even the existing EVM would basically just, like, turn into being one of these roll-ups, right? So that's like ultra minimal uh, L1, right? Like base, you know, so the EVM is not even part of L1 anymore. So that's also a possible future. Then uh, number three would be, yeah, uh, uh, so this is, I uh, mean, like third from the left or second from the right, is if uh, you take uh, Ethereum and then you add somewhat more functionality to provide somewhat more value to L2 so that L2s have to do less. And the specific idea I had is basically that, uh, 
like on L1, you could uh, try to reduce the confirmation time down to four seconds. And uh, I mean, maybe you could do two seconds for the more conservative one, right? And the argument for why you should be able to do it without too many assumptions is because uh, like we yeah, are already yeah, like relying on like roughly that level of network latency already. And like if you just optimize for providing confirmations, you don't need that many validators, right? Like you could provide a basic confirmation with just like a sample of a, a smaller number of validators so you don't have to wait for you know, like the aggregation step, for example, right? And then you, know, you have like, for example, like swats every four seconds, finality every 16, and then if you do that, then uh, you have like the the number of uh, rollups that can be based rollups ends up increasing a lot, right? You know, basically, there's a lot of rollups that could just that would just be able to become simpler and just say we're not doing our own sequencing. We're basically just gonna accept whoever provides things on layer one. So that's the you know the, the kind of you know third from the left, and then fourth from the left is basically yeah you know radical departure from L2 centric Ethereum where basically we say L1 is refocusing on being a platform for you know, like DeFi and other applications and realistically that requires even faster block times and then there might be some things that require layer twos but that's more in the space of like high performance gaming stuff enterprise blockchain you know like non-financial blah 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 right and like primary activity uh, like just uh, continues uh being on uh, Ethereum L1. So like those are you know, like the possibilities that I see. Yeah. So like on one end of that spectrum, you have mm -hmm. sort of going back towards like monolithic. Yeah. And then on the other end, you have to, so going mm -hmm. to very, towards very modular and like very simple. Yeah. Uh, a very simple layer one that does mm -hmm. verification and everything else on top is yeah. providing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, or using Ethereum to, be, to for security. Mm -hmm. Like what, what, what do you think is the optimal path forward um you know, looking at the sort of landscape of other blockchains out there whether it's like solana with one approach or mm. uh like the cosmos approach mm -hmm. uh what 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 you think is the right for ethereum yeah i mean i think uh like basically yeah you know out of the ones that i mentioned right like the one on the right is kind of you know the more solana like and the ones um, on the left are like more cosmos like plus i um, mean a stronger idea of shared security yeah um so uh I mean, I'm currently, yeah, you know, like still leaning like somewhere between the second and the third, right? Uh, so uh, keep things all too focused and like don't try to do too much because if you try to do too much, then like that does make it harder to be decentralized. Then like, I mean that not just in a technical sense, but also in like an ongoing development sense. Like if a protocol needs to rapidly iterate in order to set, keep satisfying the needs of applications and like it's actually harder for like decentralization to be genuine there, right? Because like there's just more need for like a common strategy to do that kind of uh, iteration the uh, yeah but then you know on the yeah, other side like there's definitely yeah you know a risk of like create having an l2 ecosystem that's kind of too uncoordinated and like you don't actually get the a lot of the benefits of i mean like shared interoperability or even uh, shared security and uh, like that's something that I also don't want. So I think this uh, idea of like being uh, this common layer that provides uh, you know shared security, some level of uh, shared interoperability, because uh, you know an L2. The nice thing about an L2 is that it doesn't have to verify a consensus of other L2s if it could just verify on-chain state roots. Um, and uh, like you know you have the you, you like you can always have a common Merkle pass, right? Um, and then I mean like possibly yeah. A couple of other things but uh, like don't really try to go too far beyond that like that just feels like it makes the most sense um but uh in, you know there's uh obviously still a long time for the ecosystem to like uh, you know, like really fully evolve so um you know, people talk a lot about like sort of validator stake decentralization mm -hmm. like on the block building side right you have like yeah. three entities that yeah. basically make like almost all the blocks yeah i think that's what do you think about that? Do you think it's a problem? Yeah, I mean, so there's basically yeah I mean, two paths out of that, right? So, like these are you know like what I call I mean like minimization and quarantine, right? Basically, yeah. So the first path basically says like we actually yeah do a hard pivot relative to you know like 2021 era Ethereum thought, and uh, we basically yeah go back to try to you know like kill the beast of uh, proposer centralization. And, uh, you know, like, one of the big ideas that's been floating around is, like, the multi-proposer concept, right? Like, you elect multiple proposers in a slot, and then they each uh, provide a list of transactions, and then 
the actual block gets formed by taking the yeah, union of those transactions and then like ordering them uh, by fee. That's right, like the Solana. That's right. right. I mean, it's like like, like Myst Mystic Eddy is like yeah. the one of the, uh, the protocols that's doing that. Yeah, so that's one of the ideas. And uh, like, if you can do that successfully, and if that works, then uh, obviously, you know, in some way, the problem is solved, right? But you know, there's obviously a lot of ifs on like, you know, like, does that work? The other approach, uh, which is uh, you know, quarantining, is basically, yeah, you know, you be essentially, yeah, you take this concept of inclusion lists, and then you keep on like beefing up that concept until inclusion lists start to take up like basically almost uh, the whole block. Right, and then the thing that you're auctioning off is basically just, uh, like, basically just essentially, you know, like top of block rights, right? And uh, you auction off top of block rights with a different mechanism. And the idea would be that, like, even if, like, uh, you know, the mo whoever you consider the most evil actor in the world, like, gets to control top of block for every slot, there's like still a limit to how much bad stuff they can do, and they can't actually like censor anyone for more than. Uh, I mean, theoretically, even for, uh, like for more than one slot or even for more than zero slots, right? So that's uh, also um, like in a nice outcome. I mean, it definitely feels a lot less satisfying than just like getting rid of the pro mm -hmm. of the problem in its entirety. But it's uh, you know also an option. Do you think PBS was a mistake? Um. I mean, I think uh, PBS. Yeah, I would call PBS like firmly, yeah, you know, like in the quarantining camp. I think uh, you know, given uh, what we knew at the time, like it, f it felt like a reasonable approach, and like you know, like yeah, always, uh, like it, it's hard to guess counterfactuals, right? And like there could, there are counterfactuals that are like very uh, dystopian, right? Like you could imagine a counterfactual where like, if people, like if there is common knowledge of the idea that like MEV is big. And the only way to get MEV is to join a big staking pool that can use these sophisticated strategies to get it. Then, like, you know, instead of talking about like Lido at twenty nine percent and Coinbase at like eleven percent and like Kraken at nine or whatever it is, we'd be talking about like uh, you know Lido at like uh, you know like thirty five and then Coinbase at like twenty eight and Kraken at like twenty, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, people uh, would be yeah, you know, like even more um, upset, right? So. Yeah, like like you always have to ask the question of like what is the counterfactual, right? And I think uh, at this point it's still uh, like somewhat hard to say. And so at the moment this pre-confirmation topic is like very uh, mm. you know popular. What do you think are the main benefits of pre-confirmation, or can maybe you can yeah. explain also what are pre-confirmations yeah. and so pre-confirmations are like basically a way to like give users assurance that. Uh, a transaction will be included or possibly even that a transaction will be included and like what effect like what post state a yeah transaction uh, will have with, before that transaction actually gets confirmed and so today we have l2s already giving pre-confirmations on their own right like when you use optimism like you get a pre-confirmation almost immediately right and there's like a bunch of layer twos that do this there are ideas around like shared sequencers that give shared pre-confirmations between sets of layer twos. And then there's Justin Drake's idea of uh, having an L1 wide mechanism that does that like for uh, both L1 and for any L2s that are based rollups. And uh, Justin's uh, idea is uh, basically to do that at um, like this... Uh, well, like basically at the level of uh, like if you uh, if you have sophisticated proposers, then uh, those uh, sophisticated uh, proposers uh, would be uh, the ones that give those pre-confirmations. I think uh, the biggest uh, I mean, challenge of that prop of uh, those kinds of ideas is like it really piggybacks on this idea of like these fat proposers, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like for example, uh, you know, like if you have. Uh, like, if you want to go in this direction of, like, really yeah, buffing up the inclusion list, right, and, like, saying the inclusion list is going to be 90% of the block, then, like, what that also means is, like, the fat proposal only controls 10% of the block, and so only 10% of the block would be able to benefit from pre-confirmations, right? So, like, you have this, like, you know, inherent trade-off, right, of, like, what benefits from pre-confirmations, like, can't necessarily benefit from the inclusion list, right? And so, uh, that's, uh, and so that, like, I think those are the reasons why I think like a more sort of L1 native approach uh, to having faster slot times that doesn't depend on like pre-con uh, proposers doing custom things would be healthier 
But then obviously there's like a limit to how far it can go, right? Because like you can do four seconds, maybe you can do two seconds, maybe you can't. But with uh, proposer based, like the proposer can obviously give you pre confs like every 42 milliseconds or whatever. What, what do we achieve with pre confs? Is it just like better just, censorship resistance? Uh, no, well, uh, I mean, kind of the opposite, right? Because uh, like if the proposer wants to censor you, you'd still have to wait the full 12 seconds to get in with through an inclusion list. What we achieve is like better confirmation times experienced by average users. Right. Like if it's like today, if you make a payment, right, then like you have to wait for like one or two swaps for it to get accepted. And it's like not too bad, right? Like the waiting time is comparable to like what it, uh, you know, like we experience with credit card payments. But at the same time, it's like much slower than what we could be and much slower than what we're used to in a lot of other contexts, right? And so instead, if you had like, you know, like payments on L1 or on L2 is to just confirm in 42 milliseconds, then uh, like that would, would actually be a much better experience for users. And then like that benefit increases even more once you get into you know, things like non-financial applications. Right. right. The moment still like right crypto is basically mainly used for like trading financial applications mm. do you hope that's going to change yeah absolutely um so i've been uh you know like very uh impressed by uh poly markets uh growth recently like that feels like that's the one um you know not purely financial application where it's like getting attention from huge masses of non-crypto people right mm -hmm. uh, and like, this is uh, not even just, like, trading value. It's, like, direct use value. Like, people want to know what the probabilities are that different things are going to happen. Um, and then uh, the decentralized social space, I feel like it's also kind of, like, breaking out somewhat, right? Like, there's a lot of people on places like Farcaster that are not sort of natural crypto people. So, that like, they're just people who like Farcaster for what Farcaster is. Um, and... Uh, it's like the, those are both things that would not have been possible five years ago because five years ago the, it was not possible to give to make a crypto application without you know like the crypto standard of annoyingness which is like uh, you know which was then uh, you know like not something that uh, anyone who's not a crypto person would have been uh, willing to go through right but now we're at the point where like it's uh, it's much better than that mm -hmm. yeah account abstraction is also like a very popular topic right now like a lot of projects are yeah wanting to integrate mm -hmm. um, and build account abstraction. Mm. Um, where do you think we're at in terms of having mm. that be widely adopted? And how, also, like, how does how does interoperability sort of fit into the mm. account abstraction idea as well? Yeah, uh, so smart contract wallets have become way more mainstream over the last five years, right? Like, uh, if you ask, at least at a crypto conference, how many people have a safe, like, it's like almost half the audience, right? I mean, like especially if it's a if it's a, a technical group. So uh, that the the challenge is like with account abstraction is like we want like accounts that are you know like safes to have uh, like to feel as native as uh, EOAs do, right? Like we want all you know, like we want contract wallets to have EOA level nativeness, and uh, that's uh, something that is uh, like we're getting towards slowly. Like I think. Uh, one of the other, you know, like one of these, uh, like 2020 era, like pivots that's being like pivoted back now, right? Is like with USD 437, we made this big pivot from trying to do things on L1 to trying to do like that whole thing as a the, as an ERC. And I think that really helped get the ecosystem kick started. But at the same time, there was just like a lot of weaknesses of 437 as an ERC that you nook know, things like security concerns, um, overhead, uh, like lots of stuff, and. Uh, Older, um, also, that uh, you know, 4337 cannot benefit from uh, inclusion lists or like any kind of protocol level censorship resistance technology. And so, uh, if we can uh, like bring it back to being uh, uh, like a protocol level uh, standard, then it actually does get those benefits. So, that's um, something that I think people are increasingly uh, like rallying around. And I think. Uh, EAP 7702 was really a big win. And uh, to me, the reason why is because like it brought these two very disparate crowds, like the crowd that cares about smart contract wallets for like the longer term security and like authorization related reasons and the crowd that cares about, uh, you know, like what they call account abstraction for reasons of like paymasters and like various convenience features. Like it brought those two crowds together in a way that they benefit from the same roadmap, right? Because before... Like, especially with the 3074 path, they were going in very different directions. And that could have, I think, uh, introduced a lot of technical debt, right? So, 
Now, like we base, what 7702 does, it basically gives people what they want out of 3D74, but in a form factor that lets you basically take an EOA and make that EOA simultaneously be a contract. And so if you have that, then uh, like you actually start getting smart contract like features and you have a smart contract wallet ecosystem that actually yeah, it like serves both of those use cases in parallel. So I think uh, that's been really yeah, amazing to see. And like I'm really yeah, hoping that uh, you know, it's going to be a much smoother path forward for the Academy Traction ecosystem from here. Do you, yeah. do you feel like blockchain architecture overall, do you feel like it's converging more uh, across mm. the ecosystem or do you feel like it's sort of diverging in different directions? Some of both. Um, like I think uh, points of uh, convergence, uh, you know, using ZK Synarchs, um, I mean, layer twos, you know, there's like this uh, starting to be this like more active Bitcoin layer two space now. Oh, uh, like a lot of uh, understanding on, um, you know, like things like how to understand uh, you know, like MEV and uh, how to like build, you know, financial um, applications and like deal with timing games and all of that stuff. Um, like there's a lot of questions around which there is like more converging and clearer answers. Um, I mean, at the same time, there's clearly also like different communities that just have different focuses. Um, so, like Bitcoin, clearly, yeah, you know, continues to have a different focus from uh, Ethereum in a lot of ways, for example. And I mean, even even so, uh, like Solana, right? Like, uh, like if you ask Solana people, like which category of application they're excited about, like from what I can tell, they're very, yeah, you know, like all in on deep end right now, right? And uh, you know, Ethereum has deep end, but it's definitely like much less of a primary focus. Um, so, it's. Uh, like, yeah, there's definitely, I think, like ongoing uh, you know, like differences and just like what kinds of uh, things people want to see even happen out of the crypto space. Are you, uh, are you excited about the recent uh, rejuvenation of the Bitcoin ecosystem and this, this mm-hmm. revival of activity? And, and I mean, it's, it's definitely interesting, right? I mean, we'll see how it goes. You know, we'll see if Opcat actually gets in. Aside from crypto, what are you most excited about? Mm. Lots of uh, fascinating stuff in uh, biotech um, recently. I mean, obviously, there's uh, longevity that I've uh, you know, like, talked about a bunch. Um, and, uh, you know, you have, like, uh, Brian uh, Johnson kind of, I uh, mean, like, taking, uh, like, a- actually, yeah, doing the thing that I wanted someone to do a year ago, which is, like, making, you know, a version of, uh, you know, like, his package for the everyman, right? Like, something that you can do if you don't have uh, like 15 hours a day and $20 million to spare. Uh, so <laughs> that's uh, so like, that's been interesting. Um, what, what are you doing to live forever? Yeah. I mean, I'm like, you know, like I'm definitely, yeah, I've actually started, uh, I'm like taking some of the, yeah, Brian Johnson pills. Um, <laughs> I've, uh, I mean, I'll, there's, I continue to do normy stuff like, uh, you know, exercise, uh, like, you know, like not eat sugar and like, uh, you know, the basic stuff. Um, and then otherwise I'm just like staying and observing the space. I think like from a funding perspective, the situation definitely looks much better than it did 10 years ago. I think, uh, the space just has like much more legitimacy now. Um, outside of, uh, the longevity space, another, uh, space that like continues to be important is I think the like anti pandemic and like anti airborne disease uh, space, right? That's something that, uh, since COVID, I mean, obviously, yeah, like the mainstream has just totally forgotten about it, which I think is like actually kind of shameful because, uh, you know, like one, like long COVID actually does continue to be a pretty significant risk. Um, and uh, two, because uh, if you think about like artificial plagues as uh, you know, like one of the big uh, you know, like threats to human life in the 21st century, like in, uh, in Toby Ward's, uh, you know, like a book on existential risks, like bio risk is like number two right after AI, right? And uh so there's uh, a, like a huge amount of value in caring about it, but at the same time, like there is this subculture that continues to care about it, and like it's actually going stronger. And like if you think about things like our ability to just like test for the disease, right? Like we have PCR quality yeah, mach- tests that are that can be done in machines that can that, uh, that can like almost fit in your pocket, right? So 
a lot of improvements on tests, improvements on vaccines, improvements on uh, like masks and like uh, improvements on uh, air filtering. Um, like basically, yeah, if you if you like take take uh, even existing air filtering technology and we just like put it in every room, then like you can basically make humanity airborne disease proof, right? And like I think people haven't like clued into this, but uh, you know that tech is still moving forward. Um, so that's also something I yeah you know follow, and I think it's uh, still. Uh, really valuable to keep uh, working hard on. Um, Do you think DCI is going to be... Uh, I Absolutely, I think. Uh, yeah, so uh, DCI, I think, uh, like, it's been a meme for a while, right? And, uh, like, at some point, every meme has to turn into, like, specific concrete pathways to do things, right? And, like, the top two seem to be, like, coordinating funding and... Uh, this concept of like doing decentralized trials, right? Like basically you're like actually getting this, uh, like a large group of people to actually be willing to like basically, yeah, you know, like A-B test particular, like whether it's substances to take or like, or lifestyle changes to make. And uh, I think there's uh, definitely value in like using you know, like DAOs and large scale groups to try to coordinate some of both. Um, so that's been interesting. I mean, uh, it's good to see, you know, things like Vitalia happening, and uh, I hope more of that happens. Uh, what's your outlook for, like, state of the geopolitical landscape right now? That's a fun one. <laughs> I mean, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, like, it, it does, I mean, it, like, it feels like there have been, like, so many different uh, changes um, over the last, uh, you know, like, 10 years. I mean, just, like, the level of, uh, like, a like friendliness and uh, you know like assumption of uh, you know like peace and cooperativeness and good faith has obviously just like gone uh, you know like down a lot uh, even like basically gone down to zero in uh, a lot of different cases um i think uh, i mean the question of i uh, mean you know, like what you should even do if you like care about i um, mean you know, like things like freedom and human rights for example has like changed a lot right that's like uh, i mean that's like one of those uh, questions where i think like at the same time as um, it's, uh, be or even like because people have, like in politics have uh, like definitely started caring about those things less, it's like also become more nonpartisan, and so it's become like even like I even think easier to care about in some sense. Um, but uh, you know, like at the same time, there's like uh, this is happening at the same time uh, like as. Uh, there's just like more and more big problems happening in uh, all in all of those areas. Do um, you think yeah. Ethereum is going to compete with nation states? That's uh, uh, that's what you mean by compete, right? Like I think uh, Ethereum is like not on the same level as uh, nation states in some sense, right? Because uh, you know it's not like a player that's like dogging it out with like the US or China or India in the same way that those countries are like dogging it out with each other, right? It's uh, like it's something that intersects with all of them and is uh, you know, like also not uh, any part of all of them uh, or not a part of uh, any of them, right? So I think uh, the exact role that the uh, crypto space is playing is like still figuring itself out. I mean, I think uh, just uh, like creating and maintaining these uh, you know, like very multinational uh, communities that uh, where people from very different uh, places uh, you know like still feel like they're part of the same thing and they're part of the same team like that alone I think is uh, a contribution to world peace that's uh, being uh, you know, like I, I think uh, you know like not uh, appreciated or you know like kind of priced in um, enough uh, by uh, a lot of people right so I think uh, the things that will make the 21st century great are things that will, you know, like happen um, over the internet and that, that will, you know, like form and maintain themselves internationally. And I think it'll be, you know, like some combination of uh, the internet, crypto, other technologies, other channels that make that happen. At the same time, like in the near term, we're in for a lot of challenges, right? And, uh, you know, there's... Uh, all I mean, obviously, yeah, you know, wars uh, continuing to be yeah, ongoing. There's um, obviously yeah, all of the yeah, discussions around uh, you know AI and like and uh, the politics of that. There's um, obviously yeah, you know, the while we're trying to like build better forms of uh, social media, there's like info war happening on existing social media. Um, so. You know, it feels like community notes kind of came in, you know, like just in time. And like, we'll see if we can uh, 
like we get like even stronger and even better versions of uh, things like that. Uh, there's like obviously yeah, you know, like natural resource issues and like energy and like that's obviously yeah, you know, a, a, a very major geopolitical issue at the same time as uh, you know, it feels like solar is like finally starting to actually yeah get to the point where it's uh, really making a uh, big impact, right? And uh, you know, if uh, oil actually becomes irrelevant like 20 or 30 years from now, then like that's gonna reshuffle things a lot. And then, uh, you know, climate change also is going to reshuffle things a lot, right? Because of, uh, like, it's, uh, like, I'm definitely not, uh, you know, a climate doomer in the sense of, like, believing it's going to, you know, like, literally cause human extinction or anything uh, like that. But, like, it is uh, going, like, it's already causing, you know, like, very serious problems, like, exacerbating heat strokes that are, like, killing people and making life pretty bad for people in, you know, like, places like India and Pakistan especially, right? And so... Uh, and like there's uh, big parts of the world that that probably are going to become less livable, um, and then uh, you know at the same time for uh, like a lot of uh, more uh, northern climates, it's like kind of uh, you know, like almost uh, neutral. And like uh, I mean, you could say slightly positive, but then you have to remember that like actually this stuff is going to exacerbate conflicts, and conflict is bad for everyone, right? Um, so that's. Uh, yeah, and um, also another one of the like, like there's just all of these, uh, I mean, like different trends. I mean, even climate change itself, right? It's like a technological trend in multiple ways, right? Because it's something that is entirely caused by previous waves of human technology, and then it looks like it's going to be solved by, uh, you know, the next wave of human technology. But like, is that actually even uh, going to come fast enough, right? So, I think Ethereum you know, is going to become a nation state someday. I think uh, like the game of trying to become a nation state is the wrong game right and uh, like i think the thing that people are after with becoming a nation state is like uh, you know you have uh, uh, like this I this ideal of like internationally recognized sovereignty and there's like this theme that like oh you know if you have internationally recognized sovereignty then like you're going to be safe right and like what we see it is like in reality you're know, like very unfortunately like no you know ha even having international recognized sovereignty is like not any kind of guarantee that you're going to be safe right like i uh, you know i wish it was but uh you know like that's uh definitely yeah not the world that we live in right and uh and i like i feel like uh, the right frame to think about is like we think about blockchains as being a new kind of actor right and you think about like internet native communities internet native structures as being a new kind of uh, actor, right? And uh, like we're seeing the, uh, you know, the edges between those um, actors and the traditional world, like, you know, like being contested and being, uh, you know, like negotiated over in uh, real time, right? Like as, uh, you know, like, like whether or not, you know, cryptocurrencies have, um, you know, like ETFs as like in some ways the uh, equivalent of, I uh, mean, you know, like whether or not like, you know, like one, nation state and another have you know like a certain type of trade agreements right it's like uh you know like what kind of walls are we going to see between like internet native structures and the uh, existing world um like these are things that are being figured out in real time um and yeah i mean there's like a lot of uh challenges there what do you think the impact mm -hmm. of ai is going to be on ethereum i mean the impact of ai is going to be a uh, crazy uh, massive uh, on the entire world in this century right the challenge is like we have no idea what the direction is going to be right it's like uh, you know either it makes the world a total utopia or it literally kills everyone um or um we get some kind of uh, you know totalitarian centralization dystopia or we get uh, you know like something that's like uh pretty yeah pleasant but it's still basically yeah uh you know like it's like only pleasant if you wants to be a sheep and otherwise it's like a global government and then maybe 500 years later it slides off the rails anyway um like and then you know, like even if you go into like very near term i mean like present day stuff right it's uh like uh, you know like people are saying like you know like what's uh, gonna happen uh you know when like when is there gonna be the first disaster when uh, when uh, something about AI like really kills people. It's like, no, like that's like reality, you know, like in, you know, like Ukraine and Gaza and like, and other places you know, like every week. Right. And, uh, that, that's uh, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> like, uh, he like it's, it's heavy stuff. Now it's going to become heavier. Right. And, uh, it's uh, going to become, you know, like super important. Um, 
And, and you know, I think w within the crypto space, uh, you know, like it's almost like it's easy. It's easier to answer the near term stuff uh, because uh, you know the near term stuff just kind of feels more pleasant and happy, and we at least kind of know what's going to happen, right? Like with near term stuff, you know, you have we, we, like we've had AIs being market makers for like five years already, and like that's. Uh, like people talk about, oh, when will we see crypto AI crypto intersections? And like that's been an AI crypto intersection that's existed for like over five years. Um, then, uh, you know, AI is participating on prediction markets. Uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna start to see more and more of that start to happen. Then uh, we're gonna see uh, yeah, AI is uh, participating in. Uh, uh, well, so, uh, other kinds of crypto applications, uh, you know, like starting to go beyond the financial. Uh, you know, we're going to see yeah, AI applications. Uh, in, what other things? People are going to try to you know like do the whole like AI judges on chain thing, and there's like versions of that that can work. There's versions of that that are totally horrible, and like people are inevitably going to try to do both, probably including. Including some of the horrible stuff first, and like something's gonna break at some point. Um, do, you, do you hope yeah. you're gonna merge with AI someday and become even smarter? Okay, the, the, so like the whole like human AI, you know, like collaborative intersection thing. Like to me, that's the best case scenario, right? Like to me, yeah, the kind of AI tools that I want to see is like not AI that just goes off on its own, right, and just like becomes a more and more autonomous agent and does crazy stuff. It's like uh, AI that. Uh, I, where, you know, you have this like constant ongoing interaction where uh, you know, like basically the AI is like actually helps you at like every yeah, step of the process, right? And like it continues functioning as a tool. And then you know, like with things like brain computer interfaces, we can have like more and like you know, something closer to real time communication. And then like eventually we end up merging with AIs at some point, whatever that, or, or whatever that means, right? Like that seems like the only path where that's, uh, actually uh, is uh, realistic in the long term, right? Because uh, in the long term, eventually some something super intelligent is going to come out and like it is going to win over non-super intelligent things. And like either that thing contains humans or that thing doesn't contain humans and humans are permanently disempowered, right? And like this idea that, uh, you know, 100 to 130 IQ humans can like permanently, uh, you know, like remain in control of, uh, you know, like these, uh, like 50,000 IQ super intelligent to like things is like totally unrealistic, right? It's like, uh, you know, imagine if, uh, you know, like you give a six year old, you know, like a legal control over like an adult company. It's like, well, no, you know, like the yeah, adults are going to figure out how to make the six year old order, like what whatever they actually wanted in the first place. Right. And so, uh, like, I don't like, to me, like a big part of the reason I'm in the space is like, I don't want human disempowerment, right? Like that's, uh, you know, like centralization is human disempowerment, right? And if uh, you have like super intelligent AIs that are totally separate from humans, then like that's uh, kind of the natural outcome. And so like, yeah, I mean, some kind of, you know, like AI human, you know, like short term collaboration and longer term merge like outcome, you know, like that is the thing that I want to see. And like, there is a lot of really amazing stuff that could come from that, right? Like that can solve longevity. It can solve like basically every field of science. It can help, you know, humanity explore the stars. Um, and, uh, you know, we can get an uh, amazing world and like, you know, people don't basically, yeah, you know, like, don't have to suffer anymore. And uh, I think that's like really yeah, beautiful and that's great. But, you know, there's definitely yeah, like challenges in actually getting there. I mean, there is this, uh, you know, the question of like, uh, you know, can crypto help, which is like, you know, I think the question that a lot of people want um, answers to. And like, I think, uh, I mean, real, like, you don't want to like do artificial pigeonholing, right? Like, you don't want to like say, oh, you know, hey, I believe in decentralized AI and therefore we're going to do AI on the blockchain. It's like, you know, like there is one form of decentralized AI that's practical today. And that form of AI is running models locally on your laptop, right? And, uh, like, basically, if you're going to do some, like, fancy thing that involves tokens and then involves distributed computer networks, like, you have to be at least better than that, right? And uh, so I think, to me, like, the other short-term use case is uh, potentially you could have DAOs that can, like, help train open models. Like, that feels, uh, like, valuable. And, uh, 
like I think in general, if you're the goal is to like ch train better open models that can run like locally on people's hardware, then like that feels very good from an openness perspective and like that sort of stuff. Like from what I can tell, it feels very unlikely that it'll actually contribute to like any of the destroying the world outcomes. Um, so I think that stuff is uh, I mean like really yeah good to think about. But then I'm. Um, you know, going beyond that, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, like, we'll see, right? I think it's, uh, like, yeah, I, mean, I, I think, like, my main message there is to, like, basically don't try to, like, pigeonhole blockchains and coins into stuff. Like, blockchains and coins continue to be valuable and continue to uh, have their use, but they're only one part of the world. There's, like, entire other aspects of uh, openness and uh, decentralization that are super valuable, right? Like, I would love to see, yeah, you know, like, if we can... It's like if instead of having like 20 layer twos and like five shared sequencers, we could have like 15 layer twos, four shared sequencers and like four forks of uh, like better versions of Graphene OS, like that would be so much better, right? Uh, it's like Graphene OS is like such an, uh, um, it's uh, a version of Android that's basically been hardened uh, to try to be like as uh, security focused as possible, but like at the same time still have very good UX. Uh, so uh, on my phone, I'm like, you know, like I'm actually running it right now, right? And it's just like, uh, you know, you open it up, right? And like, it just, uh, like, it just feels like regular Android, right? But it has like extra hardened uh, security features. And um, so actually there's uh, a project called, um, I think, I, I forget if it's ETH OS or Ethereum OS. So it's like, what we're or like ETH phone, it's like one of those, right? They're basically actually using a fork of uh, Graphene OS and then they're adding like a couple of extra Ethereum focused uh, features into it. So uh, like basically, yeah, you know, like doing, and, I, and then with Graphene OS, it only runs on you know, Google Pixel phones because they're like for security, they're trying to be like very uh, specific on the hardware and they're also based on Google Pixels and like that's the most secure uh, like Android phone um, anyway, unless you're gonna like go full on and like build your own fully open source thing. Um, so if we do that, then uh, like you basically have like a, you know, like a non cringe and like actually interesting version of like the crypto phone concept, right? Like basically if you want to build a, a crypto phone, it should not be about, you know, like shoehorning like NFTs and crypto applications into things. It should be about like taking the underlying values of crypto and like really, yeah, which are, I think in a lot of ways, the same as the underlying values of open source and just like really, yeah applying them and making them uh, a reality for people. So that's what I want to see in personal computing. That's what I want to see in AI. That's, uh, you know, like want to see yeah, in uh, all, all of these uh, spaces. Final question. Mm -hmm. Do you hope to get out of this place and live on another planet someday? <laughs> so I mean, eventually I would love to. Um, I mean, people have asked the question of like, do you want to be the first to go to Mars or whatever? Um, I think realistically, yeah, you know, not the first. Um, the, yeah, I, mean, I think the, the, the challenge, the question for me, yeah, is like, it, it just feels like, you know, the costs of, uh, going to space are so high and, uh, you can get like 90% of the benefits, like a hundred times cheaper, right? Like, and he is at 3k right now. So yeah, you know, you just like, you just go to Antarctica, right? Like you have, uh, like Antarctica, international waters, undersea international waters there's like so many venues that have like most of the benefits of space and like way fewer drawbacks and like i think uh like i want to like i would rather i mean like start there first and then uh for space i mean i uh, you know, i think it's absolutely valuable from just like a yeah uh, civilizational resilience perspective right like okay I mean, the way that i see this is like you always have to have like a you know like a private good and a public good and like th like good like good things happen when you can like make the two match with each other right so like for crypto you know the private good is like I mean, at the very beginning it's like a number go up and then i think over time it needs to switch to use value and that's starting to happen and like the public good is like actually yeah you know, like making these kinds of uh you know like more um open and like democratic uh, technologies actually built out and accessible and like for space, it's like, you know, the private good is like basically, uh, you know, you get to be in uh, these, uh, you know, like international zones and you get to be like completely independent from people. And then the public good is like civilizational resilience, right? Like basically, yeah, you know, humanity continues to survive uh, even if uh, you know, like something happens to the earth itself, right? And so uh, it's so, like at some point our 
capabilities in terms of like not just going to space, but like actually having an enjoyable life in space are going to increase, right? Like that's, I think, the important thing, right? Like I think uh, a lot of like for it to become uh, really yeah, acceptable to a critical mass of people, like it can't just be this kind of like very, yeah, you know, like minimal, you know, like survival um, focused lifestyle. Like, uh, you know, like people want to be able to like go and eat sushi on Mars, right? And like, uh, you know, at some point, you know, we're going to be able to have like 3D food printers. And like, once you have that, then like you basically have like access to any cuisine. And uh, you have like, like, if you can have like access to any cuisine and you can have that from a, yeah, you know, like refrigerator sized box. And then uh, at this, you know, obviously you have the infrastructure to like do all the various, I um, mean, you know, like food recycling and like all the chemistry to make that actually work. Um, and then uh, you make that work. Um, and, uh, you have, uh, you know, like some kind of life in uh, space that's like actually comfortable. I mean, maybe even to like make the thing spin at like whatever, you know, like the RPM is so that like when you do the, yeah, you know, like a V squared over R math, you get like, you know, like 1G uh, on, uh, in the cylinder. Uh, then uh, so that actually feels like normal gravity and like you do a bunch of other stuff, then uh, maybe. Um, one of the things that, like, that Zuzalu was kind of testing out for me, right, is basically, yeah, like it was... Uh, one of the things, right, is that it was like a, kind of like a hacker house, but bigger than a hacker house, kind of like a conference, a longer duration than a conference, and it was like more isolated than a lot of things, right? And so the question is like, what's the scale of people within with which a normal person would be comfortable, like if they just like got got cut off from the rest of civilization, they just had to live with that group of people forever, right? And, uh, you know, especially if you are going to be living forever, right? You got to not get bored. And I feel like that 200 size like actually is the right size, right? I mean... Tribes that are of uh, Dunbar's number size basically is what we evolved to live with, right? And uh, like Zuzalu with its size of like about 200, like it felt like that was the right size that, you know, with uh, like you're not going to get bored and like you're not going to, you know, like start feeling um, feeling lonely. Like it, it was actually at that size where it started to like actually have like subgroups that you had to started to have structure, right? So uh, if we basically, I think for a colony to be interesting to live, like, you know, you want to have a size 200 colony. And so, you know, you need to get like a size 200 group of people that's like actually willing to, you know, like move to the moon or uh, Mars or uh, wherever else. Um, so, like, it's definitely a tougher challenge than just like getting one ship over, right? But, you know, we'll see when that happens. Cool. Thanks for hanging out. Well, yeah. Yep. Thank you.